If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multi-Amory Podcast. our first time doing a show in another country and in another language. <laughs> so, yoroshiku <laughs> onegaishimasu. So we tend to do an opening question for the audience at each of these live shows. Um, this one pertains to what we're about to talk about with everyone. So who here in the room has been in a relationship with someone of a very different culture than the one that they are in? Exactly. Wow, so, wow. so many people. So many people. <laughs> <laughs> Should we go around yeah, the room? Yeah. On, we can. So does anybody want to share just briefly? You can just tell us what your culture is and what was the culture of the other person. That's yeah. Yeah. Someone, yeah. someone over here. From America, Hawaii, and Japanese. Yes. Mm-hmm. How about someone from this table? <laughs> Uh, America, New York, and uh, Japanese and Korean. Mm-hmm. Japanese okay. Korean, too. Great. Yeah. I know you in the front. Oh, I, I see one here, too. Oh, oh yeah, Sorry. please. Japanese and Canadian. Canadian, Canadian. Canadian. okay. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. No. Do you want to share? I'm French and uh, dated an American and a Sri Lankan. Oh. Um, with my wife as well, Japanese. I'm Western Canadian, but German and uh, American. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. So this can obviously apply not just between dating someone from another country, but also someone from a different subculture, particularly, mm-hmm. which I think you have some experience with. Yeah, I am American, but I also grew up not religious at all. But I dated someone for many years who was Jewish, and it kind of ended because he said, "I'm you're not Jewish, so I can't marry you. So we have to end the relationship." <laughs> so mm-hmm. I feel like I dated like so many people around the world. It's a little, I don't really want to list off my dating resume right now. (laughs) Uh, So tonight we want to talk about specifically the concept of cultural intelligence, also sometimes known as cultural mindfulness and how that affects our relationships, how it affects um, the way we communicate, how it affects uh, the way that our values interplay in relationships, and also how it affects people who are trying to have non-traditional relationships, such as polyamorous relationships or non-monogamous relationships. So if we first establish what cultural intelligence is, and basically it's having knowledge and having control over your thinking and your actions, and that may change specifically depending on what culture you are in. So I think for me, the most important part of cultural intelligence is actually having a willingness to drop the attitude of, oh, my culture does it the best, Mm -hmm. or to drop the attitude of, oh, this other weird culture over here needs to shape up and start doing things the way that I do things. (laughs) So also we want to look at how this affects our relationships. And normally when we talk about cultural intelligence, it's for business people. It's for doing international business and understanding how negotiations might work. But we want to talk about it when it comes to things like love and honesty and sex. (laughs) Um, Intercultural relationships are apparently on the rise, which is fantastic, and it's primarily due to online dating. Um, There was a study conducted at the University of Essex and the University of Vienna, and it found that online dating has created social links between potential partners that didn't previously exist at all. 
In the past, a lot of people often met through friends of friends or through work, and that resulted in them often dating people from the same culture over and over again. But online dating has allowed for these connections outside of one's social group, um, one's culture, one's country of their origin. I, I just want to ask, is there anyone here who has not done any online dating? OK, a few, a few. Wow. Oh, that's really surprising. I know. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> very, very rare people. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> so specifically, we want to talk about uh, you know, the effect of interculturalism on non-traditional relationships, you know, the quote-unquote non-traditional relationships. Um, and it's also funny to even be referring to them as non-traditional relationships because it's like, well, based on whose tradition, right? Um, we call it non-traditional because, you know, the traditional Christian model of long-term monogamy and marriage is something that has already spread to many cultures through globalization, mm -hmm. right? And the funny thing is also that people who do actively choose non-traditional relationships or polyamorous relationships often are within their own little micro subculture within a larger culture, which may involve them having to change or abandon some of the things that their mother culture has taught them in order to be a part of this subculture. There's many, many layers to this. An example of this is the United States, which tends to be a very competitive culture. And often if you're going to be practicing polyamory in a really healthy way, an American person may need to kind of abandon that idea that they should be number one or the best in their partner's eyes and that they're going to win their affection and love. And to be polyamorous, you may have to switch to a more cooperative mindset. You have to be more empathetic of your metamors or your partner's partners in order to have a more harmonious relationship, polyamorous specifically. Yeah, so one other thing we did want to say is that in learning to understand what the norms are for other cultures, we do want to be sure that we avoid stereotyping other people. That, as Dedeker said, to be polyamorous, you already might be going against some of the things that are common in your culture, and that everyone does this in some way or another, that all of us have little things that are different. So this is to help us understand the context, not to be able to understand what somebody's going to do all the time. Mm -hmm. So tonight we're going to be talking about different cultural spectrums that different cultures lie on. Um, unfortunately, we can't cover every single possible spectrum of culture because, I mean, in cultural spectrum theory, there's like 30 of them and we will be here all night yeah. and, and into the rest of the day since it also will be translated into Japanese. <laughs> so we're just going to cover a few tonight kind of as a starting point to start thinking about these things. So we're going to start out by talking about uh, communication styles that differ between cultures. Usually this is the one that is the most apparent to anybody who has lived outside of their mother culture about how different communication styles can be between people. So the first spectrum of communication is um, low context versus high context cultures. Um, so in a low context culture, communication, good communication, is precise, simple, and very clear. Messages are expressed and then understood at face value. Um, low context cultures, they don't rely on contextual elements like the speaker's tone of voice or their body language to communicate information. And I just want to clarify that we do put quotation marks around good yeah. because it's good based on what that culture thinks is good. Mm -hmm. And I also, I've done this to my Japanese friends many times and it doesn't always land. <laughs> but, um, but I just want to clarify that as in, we don't think that it's good, but this particular, you know, Low context Col yeah, culture low context thinks that it's right. yeah. So on the other side of the spectrum, high context cultures. In those cultures, good <laughs> communication <laughs> is sophisticated and nuanced and layered. And messages are both spoken but also read between the lines. High, high context cultures are those in which the rules of communication are primarily transmitted through contextual elements like body language or a person's status or their tone of voice or trailing off at the end of a sentence. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's time for a quiz. So what do people think? Is Japan high context or low context culture? Uh. Eh, quiz! Eh, 
<laughs> yeah, I saw, saw someone pointing up. <laughs> so someone pointing up. Hi. Yeah. How about right. the US, our fellow Americans? High yeah, context, low up. context. Uh, very low. The lowest. Low. Well, no, no, not completely not low. Bad. Like, there's very few cultures that are at the extremes, sure. right? Yeah. Usually there's a mix, but it's just sometimes weighted. Yeah, Germans. Do we, have, do we have any Australians here? No? No. Oh, so we can. Oh, yes? No? Was that a no? Oh, so we can say whatever we want about them. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, no, that's um, so. Uh, Australia, Australia is another example of low context cultures, and uh, apparently Canada, also mm -hmm. Canada. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what are some other high context cultures besides Japan? British. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. British is actually a little bit more middle of the road on that. According one. to these people, yeah. they're doing these studies. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have direct experience of India? Hmm. No, we personally don't. No. no. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah. As far as I understand, in terms of the, uh, you know, the scientists who come up with these <laughs> things, that uh, depending where you are in India, it varies, mm -hmm. but that they tend to be a little bit higher on the context spectrum. I think the other interesting thing to think about is uh, countries like the US or Australia that are low context cultures are both countries that have a lot of immigrant mm -hmm. influx and have had a lot of culture mixing and as a result they can't necessarily rely on everyone kind of knowing what all the social norms are, what all mm -hmm. the communication rules are. So now how this applies to our relationships, you could probably guess a little bit already, but if you imagine two people in a relationship, one who's used to a high context way of communicating and another with a low context way of communicating, that the, the high context person might read too much into a little pause or a little change in body language <laughs> or tone of voice. Whereas on the other hand, the low context person, like us Americans, might completely miss a very important thing that was communicated through a little um or pause or something. So for my work, I work as a counselor, mostly working with people who are in non-monogamous relationships, polyamorous relationships, things like that. And for many years in my practice with my mostly American clients, I pushed everybody towards very direct communication. So I would have clients who would come to me saying, well, I want to have sex with someone other than my partner. And I'd be like, well, go tell your partner. <laughs> or I want my partner to cover me in peanut butter. Well, go tell your partner. <laughs> <laughs> and so once I started working with uh, clients who were in intercultural relationships, this wasn't working anymore. That I couldn't just tell people, oh, just go tell your partner. That I definitely had to switch my approach to being more like, just make sure that the message is received. How you get there, if you take an indirect approach or a direct appro approach, whatever is best for you, but just you know make sure that the message is received. I kind of had to change what was the most important point in the advice that I was giving. So even though a culture may be very high context in most situations, in some ways they may be very low context. For example, Japan tends to be high context in almost all situations, but they're explicit about certain things, such as about people's weights. And Jace has a nice story about this. So I have a Japanese friend who is living in the US right now, and I hadn't seen her for maybe six months. And when we got together, within 10 or 15 minutes, she poked me in the belly and said, ah, tota ne. <laughs> she, you've gotten a little bit fat. And it, it, surprised me for a second because to an American that would be very rude to say. <laughs> but then luckily I knew that okay in Japan that's not a rude thing to say, that's normal conversation. <laughs> but if I hadn't known that, that could have been a problem. I might have been offended by what she said. <laughs> So in the US, we tend to be very low context about just about everything, but we have romanticized this idea that we have to, that our partners need to know everything about us and what we're thinking even before we know it ourselves. But that's a little weird because you're probably not going to always have a partner who knows everything <laughs> that you want at all times. So it's odd that we would want that in American mm -hmm. relationships. Um. But I did want to say this is what we were talking about, where um, 
just because a culture might be one way in general, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean it's going to be this way in every All single instance. So mm -hmm. it's not to say that by learning these things, you'll just know everything about someone just because you know that they're Japanese or they're Korean or they're Canadian. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to talking about other things that affect our communication. Um, another cultural spectrum is the spectrum of confrontation and how people react to confrontation, um, whether they avoid confrontation entirely or if they feel more comfortable with confrontation. And I think this is also a funny one to analyze because I, I mean, does anyone love confrontation? Does anyone like confrontation? You look like you're struggling with it a little bit. Right? <laughs> Right? I think that's a human thing, right? To feel that we have this instinctual need to avoid confrontation. But apparently it can widely uh, vary depending on culture. Mm -hmm. And so in cultures that are more confrontational, um, there's kind of this view that disagreement or debate can be positive uh, for my work team, for instance, or I mean, for my debate team, <laughs> I guess. Um, <laughs> that open confrontation, confrontation in front of other people can be appropriate and that that will not necessarily negatively impact the relationship. And the really interesting thing is that this also affects how comfortable people are with direct negative feedback or criticism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the more interesting part of the confrontation thing um, to, to examine here. Right. So. Um were you finished with that? I was finished, yeah. Uh, Are we having a confrontation right yeah, now? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you done? <laughs> uh, so examples of uh, cultures that avoid confrontation is where the opposite of that, that disagreement or debate is going to destroy how your team works together, or it's going to negatively affect your relationship with somebody, and especially confrontation with someone in front of somebody else. Mm -hmm. uh, public confrontation is inappropriate and um, would be very disrespectful to do. Yeah. So we're going to ask the question again, like we did last time. Uh, when you think of a high confrontation culture, a culture that's more comfortable with Confrontation, confrontation. <laughs> with negative feedback. Uh, anyone want to guess what some of the top top ones? Italy. 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 Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Mexico. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. They're not in the very top, but I do. I would think that they're they're up there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> France is up there. That is a, yeah. yeah. France is up on. there. Yeah. Oh. Korea. Uh, Korea, actually, ironically, no. On, on at least, according yeah. to at least this, what social, social scientists say that it's a relatively a more lower confrontation yeah. culture. Israel? Yeah, high. Yes, high. high. Yeah. Russia. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Russia. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everyone's calling it. Right? I know, you guys <laughs> nailed that one. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they read it before. <laughs> <laughs> How about the other side? How about low? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. What else? Oh, we said Korea already is actually on uh, the low side. Would Britain be on the low side? So there, with that. us, U.S., we're in the middle. Middle. Uh, Jamaica. 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 No, I actually don't know about that one. I don't think that was on the list that I was. What would you think? Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. Good to know. Good Currently, to know. the Philippines are on the lower end. The, the Philippines. Philippines are higher. So, China is high. On the low. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Oh, yes. I don't want to hijack the question, but um, for people in in your r romantic relationships, mm -hmm. would you prefer to either be confronted or not be confronted if you've made a mistake in your re romantic relationship? Well, we're about we to were get about to, to that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, it, no, just how it applies to relationships, because yes, a person who's really comfortable with confrontation may automatically assume that their partner would just bring up a problem if they had one. Mm -hmm. But then if you're low confrontation, you may just not bring up any disagreement for fear that it may harm the relationship. And I think that it's interesting that American culture in particular tends to fall in the middle of the spectrum, because I do think that what I see is that Americans are much more comfortable with confrontation with strangers, mm -hmm. confrontation with friends or within the workplace, so. you know, it's like if you got a problem, like you're, you're going to get it, you're going to get up in someone's yeah. face. <laughs> 
But then I think on the other side, uh, Americans are like terrified of confrontation in romantic relationships. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and start uh, shifting away from talking about differing communication styles and talking more about differing cultural values. Mm -hmm. You know, the things that are driving us as people about you know the why behind the things that we do. So the first of these is being versus doing cultures. Mm -hmm. So to give an example of doing means that your status is earned through the work that you do. Uh, that if you stop achieving, if you stop moving up, that your status can be lost and that tasks and work and productivity take precedence over your personal relationships um, and that yourself is defined by your achievements. So if you're in a being culture, your status is built into what kind of person you are. And uh, harmony and relationships take precedent. Also, yourself is defined by your relationships and your quality of life. So does anyone have an example of what they think a doing culture is? <laughs> in what time period? Oh, oh interesting. Oh, oh, interesting. I think say, we're speaking about the present. Yeah, let's, let's say right, right now. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Hi, definitely. US is top, the top of the list. Of the list. <laughs> yeah. Top of the list. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. How about being cultures? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Japan is actually an interesting one because it falls a little bit in the middle of the doing being spectrum. Um, but definitely compared to the U.S. is is less. And so to talk, I mean this. Well, do we want to give examples of the most being cultures? What is the most being culture? Well, it's a weird sentence. It's <laughs> so some you examples. Being good. Yeah. <laughs> so some examples are uh, Spain, mm -hmm. Cuba, and. Nepal, <laughs> apparently. Nepal, yeah. uh, Egypt. Yeah. Uh, but Australia and Canada are doing cultures. Yeah. And the US fast. and all Norway. The, all yeah. those Western countries. Yeah. All yeah. Doing. And so to talk about the application of this to relationships, I know um, a couple of years ago I was living in Greece, and Greece is closer to the being side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I went on some first dates when I was in Greece with some Greek people. Um, <laughs> And uh, the first date questions, uh, the first question out of their mouths would be, so what kind of a person are you? As opposed to, what so doing? what do you do for work? <laughs> and I was, I could not answer it. <laughs> <laughs> because as an American, being in this doing culture, like my doing is my being. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like my doing is myself. Like that's my first answer is, well, I do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I really felt like a dork on all these first dates because I would just stumble through like, uh, well, I don't, I don't know what kind of person I am. <laughs> <laughs> and this also affects not only who we find attractive or what we find attractive in other people, but also what we think other people will be attracted to mm -hmm. about us. Yeah. So in a doing culture like the US, if I want to impress you, I might say, oh, well, I uh, run a podcast for three years, <laughs> and also I'm starting Very another successful. podcast, yeah. and I do, no, 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 I would list my jobs mm. to try to make you attracted to me. <laughs> Whereas on the other hand, if I were from a more being culture, and someone did that, it's like, oh, I do this, I do this, I do this, I would think, geez, like, chill. <laughs> <laughs> you, you seem so stressed, I, that's not, not, not healthy. I don't know how to say chill in Japanese. Chill. <laughs> How do you say chill in Japanese? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> So to, to kind of start to bring it home, the last one that we're going to talk about is the spectrum of cultures that fall on between um, uh, uncertainty avoidance, or I guess on the other end is like more comfort with uncertainty. This one's phrased a little bit weird. High um, uncertainty avoidance yeah, versus high, low yeah, uncertainty high avoidance. uncertainty avoidance versus low uncertainty avoidance. Um, and I, this is another interesting one because like the confrontation spectrum, I don't think we think of ourselves as, oh, I love uncertainty mm -hmm. and I love change. Like very few human beings feel that way, right? So cultures that have high uncertainty avoidance uh, 
obviously don't like uncertainty. Um, maybe feel more nervous when unexpected things happen or when there's new experiences or novel experiences, maybe have a harder time adjusting um, versus low uncertainty avoidance countries um, that maybe have an easier time embracing new ideas or new things, um, embracing when rules are changed or when rules are not enforced, possibly. Um, mm. That's kind of where those two extremes lie. And so again, I think this one's a little bit tricky, but if you were gonna guess what a high uncertainty avoidance, as in uncomfort most uncomfortable with uncertainty culture is, what, what would be your guesses? States, is the states people don't like uncertainty? They're actually the opposite end of the spectrum. Oh, yeah, they're cool yeah. with it. They're actually... Yeah, we're not, not the most. If I can, can clarify a little bit, it's part of that being comfortable with uncertainty is Things like being comfortable bending rules sometimes mm -hmm. might be a way to, to put that. Yeah. I guess with relationships, I hear many Americans. Uh, yeah. 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 She, yeah. She left me on red, you know. Interesting. Uh, yeah. So, like, I can understand Americans don't like to have authority pushed on us or, like, any mm. external rules, mm. but we like to kind of know what's happening in our relationship. Sorry, Japanese yeah. people need to plan everything in a box. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so, so Japan is very high, high uncertainty yeah. avoidance. Mm -hmm. I was going to say just that that um, about relationships being a different standard from how we are with mm -hmm. other things is a good example of like we were talking about with um, high context and low context mm -hmm. where we might be low context as Americans but in our relationships Which we often have an expectation that they're just going to know mm -hmm. what it is mm -hmm. that, that we're mm -hmm. trying to say. And so to talk about some examples of uh, countries with you know low uncertainty avoidance um, Apparently Singapore is on the list, which I would not yeah. at all expect because Singapore has a rule for everything in the book. They have a rules for like what breed of dog you can own and really? rules for, <laughs> you know, how you if you want to chew gum and you need to be from a pharmacy, you know, <laughs> crazy stuff like that. Um, but where this often shows up actually sometimes can be more in the business world in the way that these different cultures create their contracts. In that if you look at contracts, um, in high uncertainty avoidance cultures will generally be very long. <laughs> very, very long and very, very detailed planning for every possible contingency in that contract. But then in cultures that are low uncertainty avoidance, um, the thinking is kind of like, well, we can't possibly plan for every possible contingency. Mm -hmm. We can't put everything into this contract. So we're going to leave it a little bit more ambiguous because things are uncertain. That's OK. <laughs> uh, so just to, to give a little more context, so other examples of high uncertainty avoidant cultures besides Japan would also be places like France, Portugal, and Greece, where mm. I've noticed in Japan that everything has instructions on it. <laughs> You know, like appliances in your home will have, you know, how to use. How to use. <laughs> yeah. And then on the other extreme, besides Singapore, would also be places like Hong Kong and the UK and Sweden tend to be low uncertainty avoidant, would have more of those. So very quickly, Jessica, is it okay if I pick your brain really quick? You're, you're there in the front. You're the front row A plus student. Because um, Jessica, you are French, which is a high uncertainty avoidance culture, but living in Hong Kong, which is a low uncertainty avoidance culture. Do you feel... I mean, torn do, in two do directions. Torn into <laughs> <laughs> at any given time. Oh, now the problem is you've mentioned contracts, and I'm a lawyer, so... <laughs> yeah, this is totally true, because French law needs to, like plan everything mm. and Hong Kong law is based on English law and doesn't need to plan for everything. Mm. Interesting. So now you can't take this out of my mind. But other than this, um, I don't know, but I mean, Hong Kong is so much in some ways similar to both Chinese and Britain mm. that I think, yeah, maybe. Um, and as for certain uh, uh, avoidance of uncertainty as French, I thought it was just me, but apparently it's all my people. <laughs> <laughs> So in relationships, particularly polyamorous or non-traditional relationships, there's always going to be a bit of uncertainty built into that. Because if you go on a date with someone, I don't know, there's, anything could happen potentially. Um, it just, you don't always know how a new relationship is going to play out. Um, and in polyamory, it kind of pays to be able to roll with the punches, to not necessarily plan for every contingency because Honestly, you're not going to probably always know what's going to happen in polyamorous relationships. 
And I think it's interesting that you pointed out Americans wanting to be very clear about、mm-hmm. what's going on in a relationship, because I think that is another example of where it's a little bit mismatched within the culture. And I think this is also connected to the doing culture thing as well,、um, because I think in American relationships, there's always the point. Where you sit down to have a talk of like, what are okay, we? What are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing? What is this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think something that's worth pointing out here is that it's not just about not knowing what's going to happen, because all of us we don't know necessarily what's going to happen, but it's about knowing what do I do when those things happen,、mm-hmm. like what, how do I respond to it, and I think that's an important difference to think about. So,、uh, in polyamory, for example, no matter what culture you're from, we don't have much of a script, right? That when we get into a relationship and we get engaged and we get married, we kind of know at least a little bit what steps come next.、Mm-hmm. But when you're doing something non-traditional, you don't always have that script, and that can create, you know, anxiety and nervousness and. Especially more so if you personally are more uncertainty avoidant. And I think that because in so many cultures, regardless of whether the culture is you know uncertainty avoidant or not, that so many people want certainty in their relationships, <laughs> that I think sometimes that's why we see people in all cl- cultures taking part in you know secret non consensual non monogamy, which is cheating,、mm-hmm. because. There is something about having, you know, a relationship that at least to everyone who's looking at it seems to be following the same script.、Mm-hmm. That other c- people can feel certainty when they look at your relationship and they know, oh, okay, this is a marriage, or oh, okay, this is boyfriends and girlfriends.、Um, and there's not the uncertainty of like, wait, what? Multiple partners? Wait, what? Who lives with who? Wait, how? Like, how does that work? So this is something that we've already seen happening in same-sex relationships. For example, we have a friend who was telling us about、um, a relationship between two men, where all their friends knew and everybody was fine, but they were both on different work functions and saw each other while they were at work,、hmm. and one of the partners just completely ignored the other one because he needed to feel, you know, certain. Wanted to feel normal. At work, didn't want to make anyone else feel uncomfortable at work,、uh, but to the other partner, this was really hurtful and actually ended up leading to the end of their relationship because of that. I mean, I feel bad bringing us home on such a depressing story. <laughs> well, we've got we've got the Q and A at the end. Okay, That's great. I'll bring us back up. <laughs> yeah.、Uh, so obviously, there's there's a lot to learn here.、Mm-hmm. You know, the stuff that we've been talking about tonight is really just the surface. You know, if you really, if you really want to be A plus students,、mm-hmm. go home tonight and Google、uh, spectrums of culture, and your mind will be blown. <laughs> I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so all three of us have been doing this podcast for about three years,、mm-hmm. and it's really changed the way that we give advice about relationships. And so as we continue to learn about this and talk about this, it's really helped us to open up the spectrum of how we relate to our listeners and how we're able, you know, what kind of advice is actually going to be useful for people. Because as I learned, you know, in my own job, that just telling people the advice that fits for my culture、um, isn't always appropriate. And my favorite thing about all of this is that it also helps us to learn about ourselves. So I don't know. I, I, I imagine everyone here in this room, at least, has probably studied another language at least a little bit that's not their own. And I found that for myself, the first time I really started learning another language, I learned so much about English because. I suddenly got to see things that I took for granted, and now I could see. Oh, this isn't always how adjectives work. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't always how nouns work. And with learning about culture, it's the same thing. Is that by really getting to understand a different culture, I suddenly see. Oh, shit! I, <laughs> this kind of direct communication or this type of confrontation isn't. Good. It's just how we do it.、Mm-hmm. So、um, we're about coming to the end of our time here, and so we wanted to open it up to all of you. If you have any questions or anything that you want to talk about,、um, and this could be anything. Yeah. Could be just about 
polyamory,、mm-hmm. or and it doesn't have to be just about this topic tonight.、Mm-hmm. We're also going to be hanging out after the show if.、Um, You're high on certainty avoidant and、um, <laughs> want to just come talk to us personally. We're totally talking- normal. <laughs> <laughs> yes.、Um, I'm curious, as a poly person who is American who moved to Japan, it's really difficult to find community here.、Mm-hmm. Um, so, like even in the states, but especially in Japan, I always end up being the person who's like the the token at the party.、Mm-hmm. Oh, let me tell you about this. <laughs> uh, but it's nice, of course, to be around people who you can share some common ground with.、Mm-hmm. So, do you have? I mean, you've been doing this for a few years, right? So,、mm-hmm. you have some. You've reached out to people. You maybe、mm-hmm. built some sort of community. Do you have some advice about seeking resources for poly communities? My number one advice for finding a poly community is、uh, start a podcast. That's true. Definitely more than there is. <laughs> I know that wasn't helpful.、Um, I mean, because yeah, I mean, in starting the podcast, in actually, there might be something to that. In talking about it openly, we've been really surprised by how many people have just kind of come to the topic, as it were.、Um, Um, and outside of you know, there's the obvious things like searching for a polyamory meetup group on Facebook or on Meetup, but you know, usually most poly people have exhausted those options already.、Um, uh, searching slightly outside of that bubble, like to things like LGBTQ friendly communities,、mm-hmm. sex positive communities, even going further outside of that bubble into like really geeky communities,、sure. um, yeah. or into like.、Uh, um, Especially in the states, like burner communities, like there's definitely communities where there's overlap,、mm-hmm. where they're not directly based on what kind of relationships we're doing, but they are spaces that are like really maybe more comfortable or more friendly with non-monogamous, non-traditional, non-traditional、yeah. lifestyles, as it were. I'm really glad we have a translator who understands what burners. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's really American. <laughs> <laughs> Bonding, they have a community here.、Too. Really? Okay, great. Yeah, really? Yeah, really? Really? Okay. Great. Oh, <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah.、Um, Bonding among. I think I think the last piece of advice that I would give is there is something to if you build it, they will come.、Um, mm-hmm. There's been many people who, as we've run this podcast, have reached out to us with the same question of, you know, I live in the middle of nowhere. Or I live in a small community, or I live in a conservative community. How do I find other people? And、um, often we've encouraged these people to be like, be the first person to create the meetup group, yeah, make your own community, and people come.、Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of that same thing of like talking about it openly does attract people who also want to talk about it openly.、Yeah. I found.、Um, I also would say stick around afterward, and we can <laughs> talk more about it. But I also bet a lot of people here would also know. Uh, you know, would would have suggestions、oh, of that as well. Yeah, like that, 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 <laughs> that whole shadow over there, there. <laughs> the whole shadowy corner over there. <laughs> <laughs> is this, is, where is the meetup group? There's They're spread、oh, throughout. Spread around, but there's still a few. That's where I came. Nice. Excellent. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Y
Um, and this question actually reminds me of a very fantastic book that I would recommend to everybody. Um, on the podcast a few months ago, we interviewed Carrie Jenkins, mm. who's a philosopher, and she wrote this book called uh, What Love Is and What It Could Be. Um, and she wrote the book in response because she identifies as polyamorous, mm -hmm. bisexual polyamorous, and someone had told her, oh, that's not real love, what you're doing. <laughs> and so being a philosopher, she went to, well, what is real love? <laughs> <laughs> and then there was a book. <laughs> and that's, if anyone's interested, that's a really fantastic book that examines the ways that we used to define love mm -hmm. and how that definition has changed now. It's a really beautiful book. That's me, that's me putting the answer off on somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank mean? you for that question. Thank that's you. Yeah. Yeah. Such oh, a big so question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Does anyone want to follow up uh, to that huge we question? A couple oh, more ago. Someone who is monogamous, who's in a relationship with someone who's poly. We've done a monopoly one. It was a it while ago. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's uh, as Emily was saying that yeah. we did do one quite a while ago, but that actually is on our list of ones to revisit, to revisit. now mm -hmm. and do something specifically on. So thank you for for bringing yeah, that up. But you, Emily, you just found the the monocorn thing. There is a Facebook group that if you are monogamous but have a partner who is polyamorous, then it's a kind of, I think, processing group on Facebook for that. And it's called Monocorn, I believe. They call yeah. themselves Monocorn. Like unicorn, <laughs> but monocorn. So look that up because you have to be monogamous but with someone who is who polyamorous is to be in the group at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at you, yeah, Jesse. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot of polyamorists here. I bet a lot of us have had different culture relationships over the years. So um, love is not a culture. So for you, when it comes to the rollout of um, non-monogamy with your new partner, when I started, uh, it was too quick. Hi, I'm Jesse, I'm a non-monogamous. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, whoa. <laughs> If, uh, for you, has your experience with one culture or the other culture been very different in mm. introducing non-monogamy to your relationships? Or has it been universal? Great. So. Yeah, great question. Yeah. That was a great question. You know, yeah. if, like the my, way you do it, is it the same? Yeah, like exactly. the way or has it had the same effect? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Like, was it very different reaction from people depending on their culture? Mm. I think, uh, to speak from my own experience, I've definitely found, I have the very American thing of like, hi, I'm Dee Dee, like, I'm polyamorous. I wrote a book on polyamory. I have a podcast on polyamory. It's kind of unavoidable a little bit. Um, and so for people, like one of my partners is, um, is British, is from the UK. It's also relatively uh, low direct, context. Yeah, relatively low context in that way. And so for him, it was like, oh, great, awesome. Um, when I was dating someone in, like when I was going on dates in Turkey, for instance, and Turkey's a little bit in the middle of the road with context. Um, it was kind of a little bit of a in-between, like not such a great reaction. Um, and then with people that I've dated in Japan, it's definitely been interesting where, yeah, I can bring it up like I'll usually bring it up maybe on the first date and then we'll spend three dates not talking about it. And then, <laughs> and then maybe we'll talk about it a little bit on the fourth date and then another three dates not talking about it. So that's kind of how it's been. Sorry, that was a long one. <laughs> I, I think this question's interesting because even, even within one culture, people really cover a range on this. Mm -hmm. There's some people who feel that by mentioning it up front, like on a dating profile, for example, right first line, I'm polyamorous, that that eliminates so many options and mm. doesn't allow people to get to know them first. Whereas other people would say, uh, by waiting, I might be wasting their time yeah. if for them that's something that's a, a deal breaker, that's no dumb deal, it. that's dumb. dumb it. It. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that, that even within one culture, people really have a range on this. Mm -hmm. um, what I will say, though, that I have found both in the U.S. and also in dating in other countries is that 
the reaction might be different depending on their culture. For example, if I'm dating in Russia, I might get, you know, that's fucked up. You're doing it wrong. <laughs> Because they're a confrontational culture, <laughs> <laughs> or if I'm in Japan, it's like, ah, so this car, right? Like, <laughs> it's like, oh, interesting. <laughs> um, but that that over time, especially if I have kind of a friend relationship with them, that over time it can, in either case, not feel so threatening to them because they see, oh, you're not a total alien. Mm. This is just one part of you that's a little different from the rest of the culture. Just like I might have parts of me that are different from the rest of my culture. So we are coming up on、uh, the end of our talk time right now, but we are going to hang out afterward with all of you. We hope you can all stay, have some drinks,、yes. meet other people, have conversations with us,、mm -hmm. um, and you can find out more about us at our website, which is multiamory dot com. Or on Twitter at multiamory. So, for people who want more information for English speakers,、um, my first book was published this year, The Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory. So you can find that on Amazon, or I guess there's no Barnes and Noble here, so、uh, on、What's、Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and, Amazon. Co. Jp. Mo. Mo. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and for the Japanese speakers,、um, Fukami Kikuei-san, who is here tonight, wrote a book on polyamory, Polyamory、uh, Fuksu no Ayo Ikiru,、uh, <laughs> that the Japanese speakers can find to get more information on polyamory and non-monogamous relationships.、Uh -huh. And、uh, we're also we're doing、uh, a workshop this coming Monday evening on communication and consent.、Um, you can find more information about that、uh, on Facebook if you look for multiamory workshop. Then it should come up. And also Fet Life and Meet Up. Yeah,、uh, we wanted to thank the Tokyo Poly Group, especially the lovely Jessie,、mm -hmm. um, and our wonderful interpreter Kimberly. Yeah, thank you, Kimberly. Yes. yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Also, thank you to this amazing venue, Good Heavens, and Paul. Thank, thank you, you Paul. so much for all of your help. <laughs> Please feel free to stay here, relax, drink,、um, hang order, out. Order some food. Order、yeah. some food. Yeah. Scottish pie. The shepherd's pie. The shepherd's pie. pie is fantastic. Great.、Yeah. Right. All right.、Uh, and、uh, thank you, thank, Tokyo. Thank you, Tokyo. Thank you, Tokyo. Thank you, Tokyo. Thank you, Tokyo. Hi, this is Princess Kali, author of Enough to Make You Blush and founder of KinkAcademy dot com. You're listening to a Swing Set podcast at SwingSet dot fm. <laughs>